All right. OK, well, well let's just get started. Um, thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon. My name is Junta Nakai. I'm the industry lead for financial services here at Databricks. Um, so our session is titled Future of Financial Services with Big Data and AI. Um, again, let me show you, show you the quick sort of agenda we're going to have. So uh, we're going to have a quick opening remarks, uh, keynote address from Michael Recci, and move over to a panel discussion. And then we'll have uh, cocktails and reception after that. So um, as we get started, I want to make a quick introduction to uh, one of our co-founders at Databricks and our executive uh, chairman, uh, Jan Stoika, who's going to give us some opening remarks. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'll be quick, and um, first, thank you everyone for coming. I am delighted to have to see so many people here. And um, just to provide a little bit of expert, uh, uh, perspective and why we are here and why we're so excited about being here, is that when we started the company in 2013, our goal in, was to make big data easy is, or simple because many people are struggling with processing the data. However, soon after that, the main goal started to become what should have been the goal from the beginning, is making our customers successful, because if you are successful, you are successful. And what that means is that, in particular for us, was to make your data scientist and data engineer more productive, because you know they are hard to hire and hard to retain. And more than that is to increase the velocity from development to production, um, reduce the time to value, to change your business, and maybe to revolutionize your business. OK? So that's the goal. So now, once you are faced with that goal, and talking with many of you, and I talk with many customers from many industries, including financial industry, we realize that actually there is a gap between what our system provided and we always prided ourselves that we are best of breed, we are the state of the art when it comes to data engineering and data uh, science. And, but it's still a, a gap between what we provide and the experts, the domain expertise in your fields. Okay? So, therefore, like one year and a half, two years ago, with Bavesh here in the back, um, we started this effort of focusing on, you can raise a hand, Baves, everyone knows you. Uh, so we, um, we started this effort, first with healthcare, that was our first uh, uh, vertical, to start to bridge this gap. How it bridges this gap? Well, spending a lot of time with you, trying to understand your problems, helping to solve these problems, and also in this process, trying for us to identify the main patterns, sharing with you the patterns we learned from other customers, and ultimately also improving our product to add features to help you process the data faster, train better models faster, and with better accuracy and um, everything you wish for. Um, so that's kind of the context and where we are coming from in the context of this uh, event, which will be one in a series of many more. And um, so really what we hope here is to hear from you, again, what are your problems. You are going also to hear from uh, other people who have successfully used Databricks to solve their problems. And we are very excited and humble about that. And also, more than anything, we also want to foster a community. So here, we are a community. It's a financial service uh, community. Uh, people who try to solve their problems using Databricks, Azure Databricks. And uh, that's very important to us because this is part of our DNA. We are about open source. You've seen that also today. And open source is not only about building software, that's a sm very small part, it's about building communities. There is no open source software today which has any success without a strong community. So you want to replicate that, and um, again, in the end, our mission is to make you successful. 
because that makes also our, us successful. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Jan. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna have reception afterwards and we have a bunch of people from executives to salespeople to essays uh, from Databricks. So please look for tags and uh, we're, we're looking forward to having conversations with you guys. So, um, so again, my name is Junta Naka. I'm the industry leader for financial services. I just wanna give you a, a, a sort of a, a brief overview about financial services and, and why we're here today. So as many of you in this room know, Financial service is one of the largest generators of data in the world. Um, it's actually the number two biggest generator of data, in enterprise data in the world, it's after uh, manufacturing. But if you actually take apart the different components of manufacturing and, and sort of isolate them, financial services is actually the largest generator of information, of data in the world. And that continues to grow very, very rapidly uh, over the next few years. And there's obviously challenges with that data because some of it is streaming, some of it is batch, and there's a lot of complexities uh, associated with that data. And how many of you heard the term, uh, data is the oil of the 21st century? Okay, well I'm gonna tell you that's really offensive to oil. Um, so what can you do with a barrel of oil today? A barrel of oil, by the way, is 42 gallons. So if you take a, a, a 42 gallon barrel of oil today, you could make gasoline, you could make jet fuel, you could make asphalt, I didn't know that. Um, but you know, all in all, every piece or every part of crude oil is processed, it's used, and it's utilized today, okay? How about data? Well, I read this the other day, only 50 basis points of enterprise data today is being used. Okay? So think about that. What other valuable asset class is there in the world where you throw away 99.5% of maybe rainwater in California, I don't know. Um, but there really isn't, right? So you know, if you actually look at the efficiency of oil, there's something uh, I was reading about called um, the refinery, refinery gains in oil. So from a 42-gallon barrel of oil, you actually get 45 gallons of output. Okay, that's because of the density of the byproducts. But anyway, so on one hand, you get 107% efficiency in oil, and you have 50 basis points in, in data. So that's sort of the world that we live in, financial services, right? And financial services is the largest generator of data. So you know, what's the context of, of why we're here? What, you know, why, why are people starting to embrace cloud? Why are people starting to embrace big data and Spark? Well, it's because if you look at the top 20 spenders of R&D globally, you'll find that not a single financial service company makes it. Right? So on one hand, you have the biggest generator of data that's growing really quickly, and also I just wanted to show on the, on the bottom left that financial service is actually the largest sector in the world right? by market cap. So you have the biggest sector in the world, the most amount of data, not so much investments. Right? There's obviously a lot of reasons for that. Um, and why that's becoming a problem, as many of you know, and some of you are from sort of what you call incumbent organizations, some of you from new entrant organizations, well, there's a lot of disruption happening in financial services, right? The way things were done in the past are no longer the way things are done in the future. Michael's gonna talk about that as well, which is um, I'm really looking forward to his keynote address. But some of the, the main issues that incumbents are facing, for example, is that there are all these disruptors that have 80% lower customer acquisition costs, right, because they're digitally native. They have much more information about their customers. They're much more productive, and they could do features, launch new features every two weeks, right? If you work at a bank, you know, my guess is it probably takes a little bit longer than two weeks. Right? Um, so this is what I like to call, you know, there's a lot of management consulting uh, stuff in here, but this is what people call the flywheel momentum, right? So when you have a, a digitally native business in financial services that allows you to collect more data, right, which allows you to create more you know, new solutions, which allows you to collect more data and collect, you know, create new features and sort of, you know, so forth and so on and so forth. And this is what, you know, people, you know, call, Warren Buffett calls the moat around the business, right? That, that is how you create competitive advantage and durable competitive advantage in today's world, that's why it's so important to be able to take that data and use it and use more than 50 basis points of that. So I just want to talk about very quickly, so what are the incumbents doing? Well, you know, digitally native or, you know, firms that have decided that sort of the digital experience is really important, there's a lot of metrics that they put around it. So J.P. Morgan had this slide in February, which I thought was really interesting. So today they have 49 million uh, monthly active users on, on all the apps that they have, and they find that those customers tend to have much higher customer satisfaction, they tend to spend twice as more money on credit cards, and they do business with more parts of J.P. Morgan. So all in all, they're two and a half times more profitable 
than a customer that's not digitally native, right? Um, and then there's a bunch of new entrants, right? So you know, there is a Chinese insurance company that, has, that's, uh, that started in 2013 that now has 450 million customers, right? It's a purely digitally native company. Well, as again, why are they so successful? They have very low customer acquisition costs, they have very uh, fast times of delivery, very productive engineer, uh, employees, and they, they leverage machine learning in a much more sophisticated uh, fashion. So you know, one thing I was reading about this insurance company called Lemonade in, in the Bay Area, I think, uh, they said they have 100 times more data per customer than a traditional insurance company would, right? Why is that? Well, because everything they do is on their phone. Right? They know, you know who you are, you know, what you're doing, where you're reading it. They know what part of the policy that you keep reading, right? So if you keep reading something about fire, you probably live in an area that has higher fire risk. Um, so you know, that's the whole point about DataVex, and Jan talked about this as well. So we, you know, we want to help customers be successful. We want to help them build that flywheel momentum, right? So you know, whether you're an incumbent or, or a new entrant, you know, we want to be able to harness the power of the information that you have in an effective way that could drive real business value um, out of that. Um, so you know, we are very focused on financial services. It's one of the fastest growing verticals that we have at Databricks. Um, we break it up in a couple different subsegments, but you know, we serve everything from banking to insurance to, to asset management. And these are some of the so, sort of the more uh, detailed uh, use cases that we serve across the vertical. So um, if any of these are of value to your organization, please come and talk to us. We would love to work with you and partner with you and help you uh, be successful. Um, this is some of the horizontal use cases. So you know, I'm sure you know, fraud and risk and customer 360 and uh, customer acquisition are all of top of mind for many of your organizations. So you know, my point here is that you know, we're serving specific verticals within financial services, but also specific horizontals as well to help drive business value. So um, we're very committed to financial services. Um, I'm really excited to be here. We have a lot of people from Databricks, obviously, uh, in this room as well. So please come talk to us afterwards and, and at the reception. And, and uh, thank you very much for coming today. Right. And with that, um, I'm going to hand it over to Michael Retchie, who's the chief data scientist at Newberger Berman. So for those of you who may not know, Newberger Berman is one of the largest mutual fund complexes and asset managers in the world. And uh, he's going to give us a quick talk. Um, about 30 or 40 minutes, and we'll open up the Q&A uh, called Tim Cook's Dashboard. So with that, I'll hand this over. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, hey, it's uh, great to be here. Thanks for coming, and thanks for the invitation. Um, so uh, yeah, so I, uh, I came into, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the stock market. Um, uh, but I, I, I went to uh, the uh, financial industry about five years ago from um, uh, being a professor uh, teaching students machine learning uh, to helping my students start a couple of companies um, in, in San Francisco, the most recent of which was uh, about 40 million a year, 1,000 people uh, doing uh, re real-time advertising. And that'll be relevant in a second. Um, but then I went into finance, and my first job in finance was working for uh, a guy named Steve Cohen, and that the firm uh, has become famous with Showtime Billions, if any of you watched the show. Uh, so I worked there. Um, it was very much like the first season. Um, the, um, uh, and then the second uh, place I worked was uh, uh, Singapore's Sovereign Wealth Fund, which is a trillion dollars uh, assets under management um, in Singapore. And, th and then I came to Newberger Berman. I described the sequence as too hot, too cold, and Goldilocks. <laughs> and so, uh, and I'll explain the, uh, the, uh, uh, that a little bit uh, as I go along here. But first I want to motivate um, my topic, which is um, that the market is incredibly inefficient and that there's a huge opportunity in the stock market today. And the opportunity looks like the type, the stack of uh, engineering tools we're talking about at the conference, and it very much looks like very large data sets and getting deeper than the 50 basis points into analyzing this data. So that's why I'm, I'm going to talk about. But first, let's talk about the idea of efficient markets. So 20 years ago, uh, 20 to 30 years ago, all of a sudden, all these uh, this new type of investing was created called quant investing, and you had these PhDs and signal processing folks who went into fin the financial industry. So this new uh, trend, which is just starting, of using data for investing, I'm going to argue as I go along, is going to be larger than the quant revolution was, and I'm going to explain why. But before the quant revolution, there was the form of investing which was predominant was was called uh, fundamental investing. So you took people with a financial background who would analyze stocks and great detail. 
And throughout all this time, including today, in fact, I was d in a debate at a conference um, uh, a few weeks ago, and the debate was, is, the mar is there anything still opportunity in the market? Well, Eugene Fama, he's a professor at the University of Chicago, he won the Nobel Prize for what's called the efficient market hypothesis. So I like the joke version, it's easier to remember. The joke version goes like this. Professor Fama's walking down the road with another economist. The other economist says to him, look, Professor Fama, there's $50 on the road. Professor Fama says, it must be counterfeit or someone else would have picked it up. So there is no opportunity um, in, in the market. But let me sort of give you the counter argument. So right now we're in what's called earning season. And during earning season, companies tell you how they're doing. And when you see how they're doing, when they publish their financial statements, all of a sudden there are big, what are called surprise movements in the price of a stock. And so I would just argue with you that if we're surprised, then the markets can't be efficient. <laughs> Right, and so let, me, so let me give you an example of the single biggest uh, recent surprise. On January 3rd of this year, Tim Cook told the world that he's selling less iPhones in China. On that day, January 3rd, $75 billion with a B was wiped off the market cap of Apple. Now, $75 billion is a big number. It's actually bigger than the market cap of almost all traded stocks. <laughs> and Apple is one of the most, most followed, most analysts followed stocks in the world. And no one knew that he was selling less iPhones in China, except for the fact that every single one of those phones has a contract. Every single one of those phones is downloading apps. Every single one of those phones is making phone calls. So the data is in the world. The data isn't in the market. Um, and so, uh, so then let's ask the question of where could I get the data to actually understand who's really winning in the market? And the answer is, is very obvious. So I came from the ad tech world. So what we did was we processed 50 petabytes of data. My company, Quantcast, we committed changes to open source. We were one of the early supporters of the AMP Lab where, where, the, where the grad students were, who are now running the firm were starting uh, Databricks. Um, so, um, uh, so, but what we were doing is real time deciding what ad to show you. Now, if I know what ad to show you, then I, know who's, then I know what product you're interested in. If I know that across all products and services and geographies, I know which companies are winning in the marketplace, and, and that's not priced into stocks. And so in fact, I hire people from the ad tech space. I say, look, come to uh, finance. Um, uh, and basically, let's say you get the best job in the world at Facebook. What are you doing? Machine learning, in the cloud, and clickstream data. But at the end of the day, you're buying an ad. An ad costs a teeny fraction of the cost of a grain of rice. I say, come to finance. Do the same math on the same data, but the positions are 10 orders of magnitude bigger. Since the positions are so much bigger, you can afford to make the math better, the data better, and you get paid more. And so the, but the reason why people aren't rushing into finance is because when they go into finance, they say, oh my god, look at what's happening in technology and finance. So you have these really, really, really arcane technology stacks. You have um, this service-oriented uh, model where basically people, you know, say, well, you know, everyone's doing work orders, you know, these vertically oriented organizations where, you know, fix my email, put a phone jack here and write this piece of code, and the code never gets rewritten. And so, um, uh, in fact, you know, I do lots of public speaking and I've done some podcasts, and I've told people, look, you know, the future job is going to be someone who actually knows something about financial valuation and can program and do some math. And I said, people come out and reach out to me. So I'll give you a quick example. So one guy I met, you know, he, was, um, he did an undergrad in economics at Harvard. And then he went to a long short hedge fund. And when he's in his 20s, tw about 27 years old, he's making millions of dollars a year in, you know, in, you know, uh, uh, investing at this uh, long short hedge fund. He decides he wants some more education. He goes to Stanford. He does a master's degree in computer science and learns some more math. Comes back to the hedge fund. They want to pay him less because now you're a programmer. <laughs> so the thing is that th there are cultural issues which will have to change in order for the industry to adjust. And, um, and so, and, but it's starting to happen now because firms are starting to realize exactly how much value there is in data. And, and right now, in the last five years, uh, lots of financial firms have started to hire data scientists, but really what they're still not figuring out is they also have to hire data engineers, and they have to get the right tool set because they're not going to be able to do the work um, with, with just by, by going and hiring uh, data scientists. So, so what we do, for, for, let me just give you some ex examples of uh, the way this works. So we, we get 10% um, uh, of US credit card transactions. So if you, anyone here bank at Bank of America? Uh, okay, uh, Citibank, uh, Chase, USAA, 
Okay. Well, it's anonymized. <laughs> uh, but basically, um, uh, so we get 10% of US credit card transactions at the row level. And, and you can evaluate these transactions and find out lots about the business. And um, in fact, what we do is uh, we analyze the data and we can determine psychographics and demographics of the uh, cohorts of customers. Um, and, uh, and we, uh, you know, uh, for example, Lululemon, they just announced today, they, they plan to expand the business um, by a very large factor because uh, men are increasingly shopping at Lululemon. Well, I can actually look at credit card transactions and say, this is a woman, this is a man, this is a millennial, this is a baby boomer, this is uh, this income level, this urban density, and so on and so forth. And, and we can actually measure. And you can see, yes, men are shopping more at Lululemon, and every Q4, they go and buy gifts. And so you can see bumps in the, in the data as they go and buy, go and buy gifts. But, but you know, and, and, so, and we analyze these data in, in great detail. I'll give you another simple example. Um, companies generally don't want to tell you. In fact, we're talking about uh, Apple. Apple no longer wants to tell you how many um, handsets they're selling. They just want to tell you about their profit because no one likes in to, to, in to disclose anything that could be interpreted as bad news. So Starbucks doesn't like to tell you about their loyalty program because they're, if you take the loyalty customers and remove them from the other Starbucks customers, then it, the casual walk-in business to a Starbucks is declining. That's never a good sign. But it turns out, if you look at credit card transactions, if you buy a coffee in Starbucks, let's call it, I don't know, $4.58, because, the tax is, because there's tax involved, there are pennies involved in the transaction. But when you're recharging your loyalty card, you're doing it in round dollar amounts. So I can determine which quarter you became a, uh, you became a, uh, in the, joined the loyalty program. It's about two to 3% per quarter. And then I can take and realign people as if they joined the same quarter and look at the step up and spend now that you get all these reminders on your phone. And so we can calculate the free cash flow that's generated by that program. So let me talk, go back for a moment and talk about the, why this is actually going to change the finance industry. So again, let's take these two groups of folks. So we have these discretionary investors, and what they do is they come from a business background, they use Excel, they use social networking, they build a financial model of each of the companies, and they do future forecasting of what the value is going to be of that company. But they want to get started involved in, in you know, hiring programmers. And so they want to hire some programmer, some quanti programmer, who's going to go scrape the web, get this magic number from me, and then I'm going to manually put it in my spreadsheet. <laughs> OK, wait, wait a minute. But the quants, the quants, what they do is they look at 10 transient mispricings in the data. They look backwards in time at uh, historic um, uh, fluctuations. Um, and so um, you know, and these fluctuations that are occurring in price, which uh, Warren Buffett, uh, Graham and Dodd call the voting machine, are just due, they're due to just fear and greed, fluctuating, causing fluctuations in the market. And so they look backwards in time, and you know, the market's going to revert back to the mean, and things are going to happen like that, and so I, or there's going to be this momentum thing. And so I can look at these, these technical signals that are actually present in the data systematically, um, but, and, but the quants are an inch deep and a mile wide. They know nothing, they don't read the Wall Street Journal, they know nothing about business, they just know about wiggles. Okay, and, but, they, they said, but they say, look, we've got to get start, start using this data from financial um, institutions and start using these financial data in our model because we're not using it now. Um, and so um, I have a friend, he teaches a two semester graduate class at USC um, in valuation. Um, and so he gets all these calls now from quant friends and they say, they say, hey, look, what ratio should I use? What factor should I use in my quant model? And he wants to tell him, look, if I could reduce it to one ratio, why do I have to teach a two-semester graduate class? So, you know, so, so the thing is, they're trying to oversimplify it from, from their point of view. But what we're doing is, I call it building Zillow for the stock market. So what is Zillow? So Zillow, actually, um, you can, if you want to value a property, you can hire a professional. He'll go and write you a report. He'll go and look at comparables. And he'll tell you what the value of this property is. Um, or you look, at, you look at Zillow where they've implemented the valuation process so then you can get a free estimate of what the value of this property is. So what we're doing is we're using quant type methods to look uh, at scale at the future, val at the future value of, of companies and comparing it to the price in the market. And let me just tell you that why this is new and different. So again, the discretionary folks, they're hired because they know the future value of a business, um, but they're using spreadsheets. But they have access to very large alpha because of these earning surprises. The quants, they look backwards in time at mispricings. They have access to really small alpha, but because they're systematic and because they backtest for the same risk, they can, they can get lever it up with, with, with debt to be comparable to the alpha of the discretionary folks. But if you build an AI that acts like a discretionary person, you get the discretionary guy's alpha and the leverage of the quants. Basically, this new form of investing of leveraging data 
plus building things systematically is going to be bigger. So let me just try to explain it a little more for folks who are a little bit closer to this. So um, I'll give you a real example. People heard of Party City. So Party City, they do lots of Halloween costumes and party supplies and so on. If you look at this from a quant point of view, you'd say, look, I never want to buy this stock because their free cash flow, in other words, the money they have left after all their costs, is relatively small and it's been small for five years. So if I just say, look, you know, what's, what's small for five years is going to be small forever in the future, that's what a quant does, they're going to, and they're going to say, gee, how much do I have to pay for this money tree that generates this much cash? And it's expensive compared to its peers. So the quants don't buy the stock. But you talk to the discretionary guys, they buy the stock. Why? Well, because they're looking at the financial statements, and they know that the reason why the free cash flow is small is because the company's paying down its debt. And very soon, the debt's going to be gone, and the free cash flow is going to have this big quantile step to being enormous. <laughs> and so if all you do is assume that historic predicts the future, you're never going to actually have truly understood what the value of the company is because you're not modeling their debt. You're not modeling what's happening with their business sufficiently to understand to understand what the future value is. But in order to do that, you have to know something about businesses. And again, the quants have been able to make money for the last 20 to 30 years just by looking at wiggles and not needing to uh, study businesses. Whereas the discretionary guys, you know, they actually are just using these spreadsheets and they can only do 50 to 100 companies in a narrow segment because they're using spreadsheets and they, they haven't actually uh, developed into new tools. So there's going to be this whole new th form of investing which is completely not priced into the market and the industry is going to change in, in, in huge ways. But let me just uh, try to be a little bit more clear about what I, might, what I mean with respect to use of data. Um, so again, we're talking about data that's, lots of data that's in the world, that's data that's everywhere. Um, and, um, and you know, the interesting thing is just there's so many examples of this, you know, um, I'll take, give you one quick example. So Glassdoor, LinkedIn, all these types of data sets are quite useful. So Glassdoor, uh, if the Glassdoor entries for your company start getting worse, then your company's in, in a, your, your stock value is eventually is going to go down. It turns out then companies start manipulating their Glassdoor entries. Oh, then I can do this arms race. I can say, well, look, if it's only the biggest score possible and the number of words in the comment is short, it's probably artificial. <laughs> You know, but that's sort of an arms race type method of trying to clean up Glassdoor. But it turns out it's a simpler way. Because if you post jobs online, ultimately you're going to hire people. And when you hire people, your operating expenses are going to go up. But if you are, have lots of job postings online and your operating expenses aren't changing that much, guess what? You have lots of churn. <laughs> And I can see that by comparing you to peers. And it doesn't require someone to enter stuff into Glassdoor. So the data is actually all out there. And just these companies are not, um, uh, not really um, uh, using it. So I was just talking about GIC was my second experience. When I interviewed at GIC, I said to uh, um, the interviewers, I said, look, I did some research online. I know that 12% of all container traffic goes to the port of Singapore. I know the government of Singapore is fairly nervous and cautious. I bet they know what's inside every container, where it's coming from, where it's going to. So GIC stands for the Government of Singapore Investment Corp. I said, how are you guys using that data in your investing process? Absolutely not at all. So I, my first job out of college was for Intel. Intel does still almost all of its assembly and test in Malaysia. The Intel parts are literally going by under the window of GIC, but they read a sell-side report from Goldman Sachs who talked to the CFO. So the data is there. It's just not being used. Um, in uh, finance. But anyway, let's just talk about data for a moment. So there's some data that when quants talk about data, when you hear this data for investing, some of that is, uh, let's call it social media sentiment uh, news data. And that type of data is um, useful for predicting mispricings. So if you know that Panasonic's going to opt out of this uh, bigger investment in the Gigafactory, you know Tesla stock is going to temporarily go down. And if you know that before everyone else, then basically you can trade on it. So it's a race towards what's called high frequency trading. Then there's some data which companies will tell you in their earnings statement. They don't have to tell you, but they tell you some information high level in their earnings statement. In fact, I say to our, the investing folks, I say, look, um, the nice thing about investing in public markets as a discretionary investor is you get these earnings statements every quarter. The prob but if you are a, invest in private companies, if you're a private equity investor, you get a data room. So I said, if you had a data room, what would you look at? So let's, so, so, so this second, time period is like quarterly, predicting this earning surprise I was talking about. In fact, if you take the sum of the absolute value of earning surprise, that's a measure of information that's not in the market. But then there's a longer term for investing. So if I know, what if I know even more than the CEO is going to tell me? Then, I, then that almost becomes a, almost like a private equity type of investment. So I buy the company that's going to be the future Google, that's actually going to be able to leverage this types of data in the future 
uh, I mean, that's going to be able to, where I can see in the data things they're not even telling me, because I can predict how much market share they'll have at some future point in time. And so that's a t the time frame for investing that, that we're doing um, at, at Newberger. Um, and so, and a, and a key thing that uh, we've been able to do is to build an environment where we get to invest. So we get to, we have a flat um, uh, structure just like we built in ad tech. It's like a hackathon mentality. Everyone gets to try ideas. And basically, the, uh, and we have to, our own investing book. So we get to prove our own ideas instead of being a second class citizen hidden in the back office doing work orders. Uh, we get to actually take this new form of investing and build it uh, build it in in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in this uh, new way, and I think it's um, I think it's going to uh, absolutely uh, change the uh, this type of investing is absolutely going to change the financial industry. Um, but anyway, so we can so let's just talk a little bit about um, uh, uh, data engineering. So um, uh, we were uh, again my my internet company were big early users of Hadoop. Um, now we are uh, uh, we, our, our 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 objective is to build things as little as we have to. Uh, so we are um, we are customers of uh, Databricks now. Um, uh, we use, um, and in fact, I'll tell you that I was very excited by the announcements this morning that Ali made, uh, both the Koala, uh, because uh, rewriting things from, uh, from Python to PySpark is a little bit of a pain. Um, and now it's going to be less of a pain. Um, and also, uh, we're a, uh, an early client of, uh, of Delta, and uh, Delta Lake is also um, very excited about that this morning, being uh, put into open source. Um, so, um, so we are uh, uh, super, super excited about, uh, about the community and about the work that's going on in this area. Um, again, but it's, it's a bit of a challenge. So when I arrived at Newburger, there was nothing happening in the cloud, and we, we built all the infrastructure from, in, from scratch in the cloud. So our, our um, uh, methodology is to rewrite the code um, three times. Um, the first version of the code is, I call it the one day to one week version. I don't care how you build it. It just has to prove the idea works. The second version of the code is the one week to six months version. And that has to be able to compete as a challenger to the champion model, which is already doing something useful. And so, but that's generally built by a data scientist and it's generally built using, um, using in, uh, in a, our Spark environment. And then the third version of the code, I call it the six month to three year version. After three years, who cares? Um, that version is actually uh, developed by data engineers. Uh, we leverage a lot of um, uh, Lambda processing on AWS. Uh, the idea, um, uh, from my point of view, is um, there's this misconception of the value of the cloud. Um, again, you know, people th and originally with the cloud, the idea was that um, uh, you would have on-prem your base level of computing needs, and you'd actually go to the cloud for your peak demand through some virtualization process. Um, I think that's really, you know, this whole utility model. I think it's completely wrong uh, because I think the real benefit of the cloud is that um, uh, if you if you're using the cloud, you could, you could, they have the same utility price for one computer for 10 hours as you have for 10 computers for one hour. So why not 10,000 computers for one second? Um, uh, and why not actually configure exactly the computer that you want to solve this task? No access capacity, no wait states, exactly the computer which does this one individual task, and, it, and you buy, use spot pricing and you buy that computer and you rent it for a second. Then the next task you want to perform is a completely different computer. Um, and so, um, and so we, are, we are processing hundreds of billions of transactions a day, um, and our, our total cost for, for uh, our cloud computing is less than one workstation per quarter. Um, and because essentially, we are, uh, we are, we're leveraging uh, uh, Lambda, we're leveraging cloud-type computing, uh, you know, and, and, and I think the way that it's going to be leveraged in the future, I mean, I have a strong belief that Moore's Law is coming to its end, and that this whole idea of general purpose computing is, is going to go away because general purpose computing is really only useful if you have lots and lots of extra CPU cycles. I'm also happy to chat about the fact that I also believe that lots of these tools which add fluff. Uh, when, I, when I taught computer science, I used to tell my students, you're studying computer science in the worst time in history. Because before you studied computer science, the computing resource was scarce, and you had to actually really write good code in order to leverage it. Um, and now you've got so much extra computing cycles, who cares? In fact, I used to try in my class to demonstrate cache misses by just changing the looping in the code. And I can't do that anymore because everything's got too smart. And so, um, and so the thing is that, um, but ultimately, we're going to reach a point where all those CPU cycles are needed because the data sets are going to get so huge. We're going to need those CPU cycles and all this fluff type stuff that's, you know, that's, that's developed in the interim 
um, of a push a button and it all writes the code for me is going to go away. But happy to talk about data, talk about investing, talk about the finance applications. And so let me just open it up to some uh, questions and see if there's some questions about this stuff. Uh, I'm super interested in everything that you were talking about investing, but I do have one question. Um, when you talked about using things like transaction data mm. uh, and building models on that, does that not get you in trouble with the SEC? That oh, sounds yeah. like non-public information. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, did I say I work I for Steve Cohen? No. <laughs> <laughs> So no. So the thing is that um, uh, the answer is no. Um, the answer is uh, so the non um, uh, material, non-public. So if a data is being sold, and lots of people are buying it, uh, and then there's a question of how material it is, and so what percentage uh, do you have to be able to see for this to be true? Uh, the answer is that the data is in the world. So look at satellite data, for example. I mean, you know, it's visible. And so you can look at a strip mine in Australia. And see how much land's been removed. Look, build, build a digital elevation map, and you know I know exactly how much ore's been removed. And then it gets moved to some factory, and from my satellite, I can see cars in the parking lot, the heat signature of the factory, how many shifts are you running, and then you stack the inventory outside the building. It's like the information is absolutely there. It's visible to the naked eye. And then I, the other thing is, I'll tell you that. So when I was at Point 72, one of the guys there, he said he was interested in um, in retail, and there are people interested in you know, and, well, this guy in particular was Tesla. So. What he did is he hired someone with a thumb wheel at minimum wage to stand outside a Tesla showroom to count how many people walked in. One Tesla showroom. I told the guy, you know, every Tesla has a tablet computer into it. As soon as it gets turned on, it goes online and, 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 and sees ads. And if you're looking at the ad flow, it's, it, it actually identifies itself as a Tesla and you, it has a unique identifier. And so if I'm looking at the ad flow, I just count distinct. I know how many Teslas there are in the world and when they were turned on and where they are. <laughs> so it's so the thing is that the the information that's actually available through lots of these different means, and the thing is that so this, so the, uh, lots of conferences I attend, there's a session on gee you know hand wringing you know is this too much of an advantage that companies are going to have, and is any of this information too much information for companies to have, and the thing is that it's absolutely. In unstoppable. Someone sitting in their dorm room can scrape the web and get enormous amounts of inf information, and so. Um, so there, there's just, it's going to be unstoppable. In fact, let me give you a real example, because I think this value of data is really important. Most companies still don't value their data. So I have to change the details, because this is a real example, but with changed industry. So let's say you approach the world's largest privately held electronic parts distributor. And you say to the CEO, Mr. CEO, I want to see every part you buy, what you pay for it, what's in inventory, what you sell it for, sectors, geography, dates. Here's three IT companies. Pick the one you like. They'll generate a daily extract from me of your business. I pay for them on a flow-through basis, and I cut you a check for a million a year. No work on your side, extra million bucks. Why not? Now, but I see both sides of the supply chain in great detail, and it gives me an enormous number of investing opportunities. So I have a friend I gave this bug to. He's a successful VC in Silicon Valley. He's walking around to companies with a contract. Well, he wants to only pay $50,000. He wants to buy their data rights. It's a land grab before a gold rush. Because basically, there's all these companies out there that have enormous amounts of data. And so he gets a contract, and he says, um, look, I want to be able to resell your data anonymized anytime I want, here's $50,000. And he literally gets these takers. So one example is he bought the data of a company, all they do is alcohol delivery in the Western United States. But which brand, zip code, volume, dates, so on and so forth. He's resold the data many times over, made lots of money. So he took me to lunch in Palo Alto and he said, what company should I go after? I said, let me just understand the transaction. I get lunch, you get what? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, sorry, long answer to a short question. Any qu other questions out there? Yeah, in the back, yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, the... Uh, the thing is, it's really, the, in a, uh, this big data is really driven by low-cost electronics. And so when I was in uh, Asia, one of the examples I used to give is, OK, imagine a vegetable delivery uh, system in Miramar, poorest country we can think of. Um, so, but GPS is cheaper than the vegetables in the truck. And having GPS on the truck allows the trucking company to know that the driver is actually still en route and he's actually fulfilling the contract. 
And so it's worth having a, a GPS on the truck. Now, maybe when the truck's finished, they throw the data away. But if they don't, they accumulate that data over time, then you know the arterial flow of goods and materials. And that's going to be enormously valuable. And so really what's happening is that low-cost electronics are making everything av available. But you know, let me give you another couple of examples about, um, about you know, people say, gee, you know, it's these big, bad um, investing folks are going to know everything about us. And you know, I think it's privacy, unfortunately, is very close to dead. I'll give you two qu quick examples. So if you download an app called SpyMeSat, I have no relationship with it. And it will actually, spy me sat, you can put a pin in the world, and it will tell you when the next satellite will go over. I can guarantee in San Francisco it's every few minutes. Now, these satellites want to sell you images. And so when it goes over, you can click another button on the app and buy the image of San Francisco in the sunshine and see what's going on. Now, the Turkish military satellites are quite high resolution, and they definitely want to sell you images. Uh, but anyway, you can see these satellites going by. Now, one of another one of my students, they're about to push out this app, which I think is called, it's called something like iSpy, I forget. And what the idea is, everyone's walking around with phones uh, that have cameras and microphones. Um, so maybe I want to see the sunset in um, you know, Santa Monica. Uh, maybe, and I look on this Google map type thing, find someone and buy an image of the sunset. Or maybe my wife says that she's in a restaurant with some friends. Maybe I can get someone else in the restaurant to take a photo. <laughs> So, so the thing is that, or maybe record, the, record what's going on, turn your microphone on, and I'll buy, for 50 cents, I'll buy the transaction. So the thing is that if you start, you start looking at, at exactly all the information that these low-cost electronic recorders of all forms that are all over the world, you know, let alone the cameras in China or in London, um, you know, and basically it's low-cost electronics that are going to make everything visual, measurable, and all of that information is going to ultimately tell us who's winning in the marketplace. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so I think the, um, there's always a, um, a great business to be in of uh, selling shovels uh, to uh, gold, gold miners. Um, so let me just tell you that the, in the, um, the, uh, the financial industry, and we know a lot about that here, is you can divide it into what's called the buy side and the sell side. So the buy side buys research, uh, and the sell side produces research. So the sell side, you know, Goldman Sachs, you know, Merrill Lynch, you know, all these, these firms, they're actually uh, uh, acquiring all this, uh, uh, you know, they've basically been selling all this research. And most of this research is a written report on why you should buy the stock, because I talked to the CFO, and I did some analysis of their financial statement. Um, and that's, you know, 100 billion, more than that, you know, dollar industry. It's an enormous industry. And if you think about someone going and building, reconstructing Tim Cook's dashboard and selling that instead, you know, by, by using the data, it's, in fact, you could actually write a blog, and actually your blog completely disrupts in Clay Christensen fashion that what's being bought, for, bought by the sell side, because you're giving that for free. And if you want to see really what's going on, buy cohort, buy, buy uh, geography, buy product, then, then log into my CEO dashboard, and I'll show you that. That's going to be an enormous business. And, you know, initially, these sell side firms were just completely oblivious. So when I went to GIC, our prime broker was Merrill. So I went to Merrill, you know, I'm the chief data scientist, managing director of GIC. I have this managing director, Minions, Coffee, PowerPoints, you know, anything you want, sir. And I said to the guy, hey, look, how are you using the Bank of America uh, transactions in your process? He says to me, oh, we're not allowed to see that. I said, that's, I said, that's funny. When I, was, when I was at Point 72, I saw all of it. And so he sort of like almost falls down uh, out of his chair. He starts writing notes. And I bring up on my iPad the front page of the Wall Street Journal, August 6th of 2015, when it says that there's this company in Redwood City called Yodely, and they have access to a Bank of America and everyone else's transactions, and they're selling it to uh, Point 72, Citadel, Two Sigma. And then there's even a rep from Bank of America says, OK, by us. And I wanted to tell the guy, look, if it's your firm and the front page of the Wall Street Journal, you should read it. <laughs> <laughs> so there will be disruption in that space. Now, I have to tell you, over the last five years, they've actually start really tried to up their act because they see their whole business potentially going away with other people selling other types of shovels into the industry. Yes? How do you write, uh, how do you backtest your algorithms because they depend on this kind of data that can forward fill over time, it seems like? Do you have problems with that? Yeah, no, it's not a problem because essentially, again, I, what we're doing is um, implementing a, a valuation idea. So let me give you a very real example. Because one of the things that happens with discretionary investors is um, they have an idea of why this company is going to be great. They do some research, and then they stick with their idea forever, and many of them get caught in what's called a round trip. 
because when the idea is gone, it goes away. So I'll tell you an interesting story. So um, Domino's Pizza did their IPO the same year as Google. And in fact, if you invested in Domino's Pizza, you would have done better than investing in Google. So they were the first company to do food delivery. And I can tell you, you're sitting in San Francisco, I'm sitting in New York, Domino's Pizza, we're not really doing that, right? Because there are 20 companies that will deliver you food from any restaurant. But Domino's Pizza is still growing because there's all these rural areas that don't have all these other companies that will deliver them food from any restaurant. But you know, what you can do with data is you can instrument the model. You can say, look, uh, all, you know, Uber Eats and you name it, they're all moving, caviar, they're all moving into the suburbs. And so at some point in time, Domino's Pizza is going to be pinned into a small enough corner that it's going to be very hard for the company to grow because uh, there just aren't enough people. <laughs> and so, uh, so you know, that's an example where you can absolutely test exactly what's happening as you see this whole thing going on and you end up with a long-term thesis of when I need to pivot out of a strategy loving Domino's Pizza uh, into, uh, you know, into some other name. Yeah. Um, I'm curious to hear your philosophy behind um, how you think about ultimately um, better forecasting and how you take more data, more information, better understanding of historical com consumer behavior and pursuing this never-ending uh, goal we have of in as investors of turning this art of taking information and weighting it in your head and turning it into an actual forecast as a process. So, so do, do, you have, do you have any um, thing you can share on that? Yeah, I mean, so one of the things that, um, uh, what I'll tell you is that, um, uh, you know, years and years ago, um, uh, there used to be this idea of this, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, in the uh, in the area of expert systems, of this person sort of reverse engineered the way an expert works to build an expert system, which is a bunch of if then else's of what you do. And, and uh, there's a huge problem, you know, in, in in investing. The discretionary investors, you know, they have, there's an art associated with it in terms of understanding the way they think about stuff. And so you have to sort of come along the way and provide them some tools. In fact, I say to them, look you know, you're trying to update 50 to 100 models a quarter. If I updated them automatically for you, how could we elaborate the model? Uh, let's just actually try to together come up with a much better model of this business and actually uh, work on it together. And so um, and, and the thing is, they're very interested in things and we can, we can answer. So, um, and so you end up learning things. And I'll give you one really good example of learning. So this is a Chipotle before the first E. coli scare. So Chipotle is growing at a phenomenal rate. Um, and one of the investors uh, said to me, um, hey, look, um, the primary uh, measure of the success of a restaurant is called uh, is sort of like a same store sales. The problem is that when you open a new restaurant, you have this honeymoon period where everyone wants to go, and then over time, let's say 18 months to two years, it falls down to sort of an organic growth rate. But if you're just averaging across all the restaurants, if they're opening lots of restaurants, you get this funny average of like a bimodal distribution. It's hard to be technical, um, and um, and so that's not a very. So what the question is, what is the growth rate really going to be once things settle down? But if I look at credit card data, I can identify every single Chipotle. Then I can actually time align them as if they open the same day and look at this honeymoon period and see what, what the shape of the curve is. I can functionally represent it. And now I can push them back in time where they belong. And now we have a future forecast. Furthermore, when you open a new one, you cannibalize some of the, some of the people who are going to the old one. And you can calculate what the maximum density of Chipotles are. And now I've got this model of exactly what the future same store sales are going to be, which is much more accurate than they would have ever had before. And people say to me, gee, that's a lot of work for Chipotle. And I tell them, guess what? Every single store is the same. In fact, I'll tell you that when Bezos bought Whole Foods, and everyone was saying, what's he going to do? Is he going to put lockers in the store? Is he going to sell 365 on, online? You know, what's the play? In the end, the day before the deal closed, he announced he was lowering prices in Whole Foods. And what he did was he triggered the honeymoon period in every single Whole Foods. So Bezos clearly knows this is the, what happens in these, rest, in these places. And so all of a sudden, everyone's going there as if it's a brand new store by just by making that, that remark. And so you learn things by actually working with these discretionary investors, and then you automate them so that you can actually get a deeper understanding of the future value of a business over time. Yes? Spreadsheets and making them scale. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there's, a, I, I'm I'm a little bit of an anti Microsoft people who know me. So 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 whenever like micro, <laughs> so uh, so spreadsheets. I, uh, you know, it sounds a little bit like one of those things made out of Redmond. But um, what we do is we get uh, uh, JSON formatted uh, models of uh, all of the um, financial models that might have been in a spreadsheet. Um, and, uh, and we basically automate that process. Um, so, um, uh, you know, the, the idea is to do, the, to do it at scale. Um, but I'll tell you a funny story. When I was at Point72, um, 
So these guys who are trying to forecast earnings surprise, if they're 51% right, um, they survive. If they're 55% right, they make millions of dollars a year. Within one quarter, we're 62% right. Um, but when I'm sending these models, they want them in a spreadsheet to these guys. I'd say to them, and I, by the way, I say guys, because the teams were white male Ivy League athletes. In fact, one of the teams there, the portfolio manager running the team had been captain of Harvard's ice hockey team. The first three people he hired on his team were ice hockey players from other schools, but the fourth one was a football player, so now they're diverse. <laughs> anyway, so I am sending this spreadsheet to these guys, and I say, hey, what do you think of my forecast? And they'd say, you know, I knew it already, but keep sending it. But when I'm wrong, they're literally in my office screaming at me about how I blew the year up. So I said, look, I come from ad tech. I can solve the problem. So I put a watermark on the spreadsheet of who I sent it to and when. I put a macro on the spreadsheet so that every time they open it, it populates my database and says, this guy looked at that guy's spreadsheet this tab this time of day. And I correlate it with the trades. So that two minutes after you looked at my spreadsheet, you doubled your position. I'm not going to call this causality, but if it happens a lot, I'm going to think you like my spreadsheets. <laughs> so the point is that that model is actually not a great model. What you really want to do is automate everything. And, it's, uh, it, and you need the right environment to be able to do that. Other questions? Sorry, I, I got to start answering them shorter answers. Yes. <laughs> so there are lots of tools out there which can take your data, do some sort of feature engineering, and uh, at the end of the day, it can spit out a particular model by tuning some set of hyperparameters. I'm not going to take the names of those tools now. But do you think it will be feasible to deploy those tools in financial industry as of now? Well, I mean, so look. Um, there's a, again, having taught university for too many years, I'll tell you that there is always a love of something which means I don't have to do any work. And so people want to say, look, I'm going to take these transactions, I'm going to throw deep learning at it. And then it's going to go and label the transactions for me. I mean, generally, as soon as someone's, what, we interview lots of funds because we have a fund of funds. And I tell the guys, I said, look, here's the simple rule of thumb. You count the number of words they say before they say the word machine learning or deep learning, and it's inversely proportional to that how much they know. <laughs> 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 so, so, so the thing is that, you know, and I, you know what, when people say, look, can I throw deep learning at this, I say, have you tried regression? <laughs> you know, because if you haven't tried regression, don't talk to me about it, right? And so the thing is that, the thing is that usually there's some deeper, clever insight, some jujitsu move that it really helps you do this better. And so there's no, uh, there's no free lunch. There's no, nothing that allows you to pass up. In fact, you know, I, you know, there's a vendor, which I won't mention, that's out there on the floor. And they remind me very much from when I was a professor, I had this uh, uh, neuroscience biologist come to me and said, uh, you know, I went to SPSS. You probably haven't heard of that. It was a statistical package you could call way back in the day. Um, he said, I tried every single statistical model possible in SPSS. This one gave me the highest significance score. How do I justify using it? <laughs> Right, and that's the problem that we get caught in, if we're not careful, of automating every single model. And the one that seems to solve my problem is the one I work with. Um, so uh, I just, I, let's say I wouldn't advocate that approach. Other questions? Hey, we have time for one yeah. more question. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, so again, I think the, the idea is that you don't want it to, um, the key thing is, um, you know, so having been a manager for many years, I think the, uh, what I tell people, particularly people who want to be a manager, is that the failure mode of managers is telling people what to do. Um, and so, um, uh, so w you know, what you should really be telling people is what the interesting <laughs> problems are, and they should be figuring out how to do it. And you should be hiring those people who can figure out how to do it without you telling them what to do. And so the, if you're just building something to prove an idea works, I don't care if it's Elmer glue, Elmer's glue and balsa wood. I don't really care how, how you do it. Um, and then, you know, in order to scale it up to full size of data, you need to be able to use tools like we're talking about at this meeting. Um, but then, you know, once we actually know it's the right idea, we want to be, you know, fiscally uh, efficient. In fact, when I started running engineering at my internet company, you know, there was another guy running engineering, and we, I, I suggested to the management committee we should have two heads of engineering. Because his job was to make the trains run on time. He was a really, you know, SLA, efficiency-driven person who wanted the trains to run on time. I like changing the gears. Now, if you change the gears too much, then trains don't run on time. But if you never change the gears, then you're never going to stay up with what's going on. And the idea of what's happening in that tech is the models are changing continuously. And so, so you have to build, and what we end up doing by co-running engineering is you find the places where you need flexibility, and you find the areas where you don't need flexibility, and you make those very efficient. And that's what leads to this rewriting code uh, many times, is because once you know you don't need flexibility somewhere, you can actually go and make it really, really super efficient. But, yeah, Great. thanks. All right, thank you so much, Michael. That was great. Thank you.
I, I would just I would just say you know, a, a lot that Michael talked about falls under a category of what we call alternative data. And if you actually talk to many of the data vendors, their largest consumers are not hedge funds, they're companies, right? So you know, so the same things that people are using to assess the movements of stocks, companies are also using it, trying to assess their competitors and what's happening. So the applications of data is very universal across, um, a, a, well, and specifically financial services from insurance to asset management to retail banking, um, everywhere. So with that, we're gonna have move on to our panel. So if our panelists could make their ways up here. Um, so we have uh, Ming Cho from Newberger Berman, um, John Goyle from Capital One, Ajay Krishna uh, from M Science, and Eric Kim from Acorns. So you guys could sit. I gotta figure out where to sit. Actually, maybe I'll stand. <laughs> I'll just stand, I guess. Um, Right, so, so the, the idea of this panel, um, so the panel is called Future of Data and, and AI and Finance. So I'm going to try to um, break it down to four uh, sub-segments and themes. The first one is sort of a quick introductions to their businesses. Um, the second one is you know, life before and after Databricks. Uh, the third one is lessons for the audience from their data journey and cloud journey. And the last one being how is AI and ML uh, currently being used at your organization today. So I'll start with John. So, you know, Capital One is widely regarded as one of the you know, big tech leaders, uh, especially in financial services. Um, can you talk about your platform at a very high level um, and sort of what were the, uh, some of the main decisions or drivers of that early cloud adoption? Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me here. Yep, thanks for the you. kind words. As just a quick introduction, I run a product management and analytics group within our credit card business, um, so very much based in consumer lending. Um, uh, my group is essentially sort of like a center of excellence for analytics within the business. So we help develop tools and systems to support both our operational use cases and also how our data scientists and analysts uh, develop models and generate insights and then how we get those into market. Um, and so uh, our platform, you know, not going to go into detail, but we've talked publicly as a company about how aggressively we are moving and have moved into the public cloud. Uh, so I think just foundationally, we've really embraced the cloud. We've em embraced really throwing away and rebuilding nearly all of our data infrastructure in the cloud over the last two years. And so I think that, that starts with a lot of the same architecture that you see Databricks talk about in the keynotes around S3-based data lake, streaming data systems, um, and from more of an operational standpoint, uh, microservice architecture uh, based on RESTful APIs, containerization, uh, serverless functions. And so we've also taken the time to rebuild many of our operational systems to run natively as microservices in the cloud. So I think it's, it's both ends of that. It's rebuilding the way that our company runs, the way that we interact with customers, so that we generate more data, we generate all of that data in real time, and we can act on that data in real time. Um, and then rebuilding our data infrastructure for scale and for real-time machine learning. Cool. Um, so maybe I'll go to Ajay next. Um, so you know, can you talk to us a little bit about M-Science? Um, I know you guys are on the, in the alternative data space. So you know, what is alternative data? What does it mean for you? And um, so what are some of the, the business value and, and values that your customers are generating from your, your services and products? No, absolutely. Um, so M-Science is an alternative data research and analytics company, right? So. Alternative data, I think Michael did a really good job of giving you an introduction to alternative data. So we dabble almost entirely in that space. So our client base is, is split into two, uh, which is both financial services. So you could think of us as what he mentioned as a sell side research firm, but a new age sell side research firm. So now we provide research based on empirical data. So as opposed to his example where he has somebody walking outside an Apple store and with a clicker and counting the number of people, we can actually see a cell phone activations, right? So, I mean, leveraging off what, what Michael was talking about, we recently published like an FD, uh, our, our, our quarter update for Apple. And given the data that we're using, which is mapping the supply chain of how many phones are actually being activated, how many apps are being downloaded, as well as being able to see like point of sale level data, what we're able to capture now is that we know that Apple is now, we're expecting Apple to have a 17% decline year over year for this quarter. We also know that in China, they announced an iPhone XR 
uh, price cut. Now we're able to track in real time, week over week average change that the iPhone XR price cut has now resulted in a 60% increase in iPhone sales, iPhone XR sales in China. So just rounding out that example, that's the entire space that we play in. So our entire philosophy is to map the supply chain of companies, right? So we believe that if you want to understand Costco as a company, you have to understand the customer of Costco because that is the primary driver of Costco. It's very well and good that you can look at company financials and bid valuation models, but if you really want to understand what's happening within a company, you've got to understand what people are doing in its supply chain. So that's what M Science does um, as a firm. Now, to bring about how our clients find value from what we do is, so we cover about a, close to 200 names in in-depth research. So when I say in-depth research, it's an analyst who's using data with the data science and a data engineering background uh, team behind him to map out the entire ecosystem of a particular company. So if I can bring you an example is Ulta Beauty, um, last quarter they announced a, a partnership with Kylie Jenner, right? So that was supposed, that was gonna be this huge big thing, but people didn't really understand the ramifications of it. But what we were able to do, because we, we have access to about 40 plus different data sets across the spectrum, one of them being foot traffic data. So now we were able to measure very, very clearly once the announcement was happening, once the announcement happened, what was the impact of people actually going to an Ulta Beauty store and then eventually connecting that to revenue through a financial model, of course. So we provide insights to our clients based on empirical data. Again, not somebody outside with a clicker hypothesizing what is happening to a company, but real true data that we can actually see feel and touch, um, and provide insights on companies to, to investors so that they can invest in. Great. Um, so I guess I'll go to, go to Ming next. Um, you work with Michael. Um, you know, Newberger Berman is one of the oldest mutual funds complexes probably. It's yep. probably around for 80 years. How, how are you, you know, can you talk a little bit more specifically about how are you incorporating data mm -hmm. into an otherwise you know, traditional investment process? Okay, um, so um, I'm a tech lead of a team called uh, Investor Studio at the Newberger Berman. Uh, so the team is responsible for well, primarily two things. One is to support our quant development. Uh, the other side is to support Michael's team on the data science. So uh, my team has a, vi um, a, a visibility to diff two different sides of the world. And um, I, I guess one of the areas that we are, we are pushing really hard is to, see, to help the Kong to see the value of the, of the data, you know, to be able to use the data platform uh, in their research, in their Kong analysis. So I think someone asked that question earlier about how do we use the, you know, how do we do back testing? And it's actually one of the problems that we try to solve. And um, I, I'll say about six, seven months ago, we started using Databricks as a way to solve that problem. And I'm sure a lot, of, a lot of you in this field knowing that when people do back testing, a lot of times they really just do back testing on their desktop machine. So I cannot tell you how many times people came, came to me and say, hey, you know, I, I have this new strategy I need, to, I need to test. I need to run 35 years of benchmark data, right? I need to scan these 1,000 tickers. Give me one of those bigger machines that you can buy. I'm willing to pay 35 grand. Just give me a, a one terabyte machine. And that, that's how we used to solve the problem, right? Run everything in MATLAB, you know, run everything on local desktop. But now we're switching to, we're able to work with our quantum team and start moving their process uh, onto the cloud. And to some point, because obviously you can't move everything to the cloud and we still have stuff that we can't put out to the, uh, the cloud space. But to some point, you know, we, you still can, you know, we, we can build the pipeline so the data can, you know, wire to the Bloomberg terminal, no, not Bloomberg, Bloomberg SAPI service. We can download enough data to run their back testing in the cloud, leveraging Databricks. So one of the cases that we have seen, uh, uh, I'll say three months ago, is we have this back test process uh, running the credit risk uh, analysis. And it used to take about, I would say, 20 hours to complete the whole screen cycle. And the whole process now takes less than 30 minutes. And that's how the clients start to realize, oh, now I can do more with my models. I don't have to use one KVM, a KMV, a KMV model. I can now layer data coming from our 20 data set to further enrich my process. So I think that's, that's when, when we see the quant start thinking about leveraging the, uh, the data science, not just from the data point of view, but start thinking about how they can approach the problem differently. Great. So I say that, that's how we use it. 
um, Eric. So, you know, Neuberger Berman's 80 years old, Acorn's probably a little bit younger. Um, so, you know, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what Acorns is, what your mission is, and how are you using data to, to serve your customers today? Okay, so thank you so much for inviting yeah. us. Um, uh, Acorns is, by the way, anyone using Acorns as an app? Oh, great. <laughs> nice to talk to you. I want to really hear go. from you what, how you feel about it. Um, and I guess we have some work to do. Um, um, so Acorn is, uh, people know about like micro-investing app or um, you, just, you use a spare change to invest. That's not uh, as our whole mission is. Our mission is to be a financial wellness system, uh, to, be the, to be exactly that. And um, there's this really staggering st statistics out there that 50% of Americans are, has not really invested $1 less than a dollar or no dollar at all for last year. And 70% of Americans are, they do not even ha really have $1,000 emergency fund. So that's really um, surprising or uh, troublesome st statistics that we have. And which trying to be a, a better bank to make people invest easier and, and, and there's less restriction happening within that space. So basically our mission is to look after the um, best financial inter interests for up and coming, who really do not have really clear path for their fi financial wellness. Um, so how do we actually do that um, is two things. We do it through making um, big decisions small. So that mm -hmm. starts with the roundup. Um, change, you, you can, as, anytime you swipe the card, you can, um, invest your spare, spare changes to your investment, to ETFs, and just regular small amount of re recurring investment that's gonna uh, also, also accumulate your wealth. And some brand partnership with our uh, farm money partners, whenever they spend their money with them and they just can earn, and earn some money to invest. So those are, those are one thing that making big uh, decisions small. And second, uh, is how do we do that is to have a lot of education around uh, finance and uh, financial wealth. So we have recently partnership with the CNBC. I don't know if you have seen a lot of uh, um, clips about partnership there. And to try to really educate our customers and Americans to actually do have great uh, education about how they grow their wealth. We can do that and we can really believe that everybody can grow wealth uh, by um, such a good education. Now, our, our customers are um, mainly composed of about, about like annual salary of 100,000K. So um, mm -hmm. that's about the demographic that, that we have. Yeah. Okay, great. So I'm gonna switch gears and talk about the before and after state with Databricks. Um, so I'll start with uh, Ajay. So what were some of the, the major challenges in your data organizations and, and how has having a, a, a unified platform uh, enhanced the productivity of your data scientists? Well, um, okay, before. Well, we were in Before a, bad. Yeah, now before good. we were an on-prem single tenant Postgres SQL instance, right, which was, yes, you, you know, right? So uh, it, was, it was miserable. Um, if in short, I mean, because a lot of the things that we actually had to do involved large scale of data, right? And at that point, I think this was about two and a half years ago before I joined M Science and M Science became what it is today. Um, I think we had about four data sets that we were processed, right? Some of them were consumer transaction, similar data sets. And the amount of insight that we were to get out of it was very, very limited because, in all honesty, at some point there would be one team telling the other team, stop running your query because I need to run mine because your server is being blocked, which is the most ridiculous place to be in. Um, so what we did post, post that, and I think as of, that was one of the first charges that I, I had when I first joined M Science in 2017, January, is to move us to the cloud, right? And um, what helped us and why, some of the choices as to why we made to move to Databricks 
is primarily because we have three tiers of, of audiences in our company, right? So one's the fundamental analyst, right? So the fundamental analyst is somebody who has the ideas, understands the companies, understands why it matters, what matters for the company, why should you track same source sales as opposed to overall top line revenue, right? Those are things that, I mean, like a traditional data scientist is gonna find hard to understand, and those are things that you, you require an analyst to understand the companies to do it. So they have an associate pool who is, who is helping them with understanding the companies and the financial research. Now we have the data scientists who are trying to build models at scale given those ideas that they prototype, right? How do we now effectively take your idea that you're covering on one company and now establish a system that we can now help you scale those ideas across multiple companies? And then eventually we have the data engineering team that's responsible again to his model, which is after the six months of prototyping, we think this is great, now how do we build rock solid systems around it so that we can produce, produce value? So what Databricks helped us do, and one of the reasons, primary reasons why it was, is it was extremely easy to use, right? We, we gave the power, I mean, it's coming back sometimes to bite me in the ass because, I mean, people are overusing compute now, uh, which is a problem that I have to scale back, but it gave us the ability to translate almost all of our workload from on-prem to off-prem in a matter of a couple of months. Like two months as of August 2017, we were completely uh, off-prem in the cloud. What this also did, secondly, was now put the power of compute in the hands of an associate working for an analyst. So as opposed to them pulling things into Excel and doing a forecast Excel function, which honestly when I saw it made me laugh every once in a while, was now we're giving them the tools where they're learning how to code. Because they had access to those notebooks, they still learned how to code and they started moving all of their workload down the stack. So prototyping as opposed to being done in Excel with the limitations of Excel, started moving down into something which was more powerful, which was in terms of Python. Now, since all of the teams now work entirely on Databricks, that translation from, hey, here's my prototype, can you help me scale this and build better models for me to let me put it in production for it to actually run in, in real time started becoming a very, very unified process because everybody was sitting on the same platform. Everybody was writing the same language. Everyone was thinking the same way. So that entire translation, in a nutshell, helped us produce an entirely new vertical for us, which is like data products, right? So our research at that, until that point was twice a quarter updates because people had to run against SQL databases, put it in Excel, and then put something out. So now we have about 22 different data products that update those insights. We call them research through data on a weekly basis. So the same insights which used to take us weeks to run now take us, take us about 40, 40 minutes to an hour. So life is very, very different pre and post cloud, I'd say, and, and, and partially Databricks as well. Uh, primarily because we were able to now provide the capability of compute to, to people who otherwise didn't have access to it, or rather took you six months to say, hey, I'd like another extra gigabyte of space in my SQL server. That's great. So, John, same question. So what's, you know, what's possible today that wasn't possible before? Yeah, I think uh, it, was, it was said already, but I think the yeah. largest or clearest benefit for us is uh, scalability and performance at scale. So particularly on our, our legacy data infrastructure uh, and the way we built it on-prem, uh, we really had t just tapped out the scalability. We had, even for a company as big and as complex as ours, we had similar challenges in terms of different users competing for resources. Mm -hmm. Uh, operational strategies competing for resources and at times being shut down because of uh, you know poor jobs run by by other analysts and so we essentially had a, a centralized large-scale data warehouse where everything was run on and, and that became limiting in, in many ways and while we could have paid to continue to scale that the costs of scaling that particularly with the increasing complexity and scale of our data um, just did not make sense. Mm -hmm. And so moving into the cloud, embracing the separation of storage and compute allows us to use tools like Databricks at massive scale. So I think we have already something like 20 times as much data available on the cloud as we did in our on-premise data warehouses. Wow. We just couldn't afford to expose all of that data on-prem. And mm -hmm. when you have to pay for co-located storage and compute, for everything you do, you start to say, hey, maybe this data from 20 years ago here is actually not valuable enough to pay for it and expose it here. Um, but actually, if you have data over the last 25 years of uh, credit performance through multiple recessions, 
Um, that's incredibly valuable if you can open that up to your, your underwriters and your data scientists. Um, and so what Databricks has allowed is really the complex analysis at massive scale on the cloud in a cost efficient way. Um, I think beyond that, uh, the unification of different job families, the ability for our business analysts and our data scientists to kind of work within the same interface to share code with one another. Our business analysts can't really you know, build anomaly detection algorithms, but um, at times they understand certain data sources better than our data scientists do. And I think Spark and Databricks and this notebook-driven interface allows them to work together and share code across different workflows mm -hmm. and different processes. Ning, what, Ning, what were some of the, the tools that you used pre-Databricks, <laughs> and, and what were the, the key bottlenecks of those tools? Well, I don't know if it's pre, because we're still using it. Yeah. Um, so, um, as much as Michael doesn't like Microsoft, uh, New Book of Burma is <laughs> uh, New Book of Burma. So, so it's really much, pretty much a, a pure Microsoft shop. So, you can imagine there's a, there's a culture, culture or, or, you know, conflicts uh, between the data science and the traditional uh, quant and the back office and middle office uh, operations. But long story short, um, I think on the quant side, uh, I briefly touched on that briefly uh, earlier, is that um, the, the, we have to educate our quant to move away from their desktop, right? So um, as I mentioned, they, they, they're so accustomed to their you know, Bloomberg terminal, they, they have access to the Bloomberg data cell fact set or their, um, their, their MATLAB code. And so those are the things that we, we have today still. Um, but we have an opportunity last year to start educating, well not educate, uh, partner with our, our analysts. Start thinking about how we can move their model uh, onto the cloud and also try to do some of the work in, 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 in AWS cloud. And it's not going to be easy, and so I, I guess we we're going to talk about that later. But uh, what's one, one thing that's really challenging is, uh, is to, we have to demonstrate to them that there's a value. Well, why we have to do the, do, do the new process, in, sorry, do the process in a new way. So one of the challenges we had last year is that uh, it came from our option team. Uh, so they have to process their tick data, terabytes of terabytes of tick data. And in the past, every time they want to adjust their, their, uh, their uh, performance or their, uh, adjust their model, it takes about a week just to unpack the data and then and load portion of the data into SQL Server and then run query against it from MATLAB. Right? Even though this is running under you know, 64, tera, 64 gigabyte machine with a core uh, machine, right? it's still okay, but it takes about four to five days to complete the whole process. So we start partnering with them and say, hey, why don't we move that whole thing to the cloud? We start doing that and we start loading a um, you know, lot of, most of, actually every, uh, all the, uh, the tick data into AWS uh, S3 bucket. We start laying uh, data bricks on top of it. And we're able to after, I would say, six months of education, you know, rewriting the model, all that stuff, we're now able to run the same thing in under two hours. And now the, the other quant team realized, oh, wow, that's, 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 that's a difference. I mean, that's a huge difference now because now actually re I can rebalance my book real time. I don't have to run this, you know, uh, uh, theoretical analysis you know, five days or a week before the actual things needs to happen. Now I can actually do real-time analysis and then do my trade before the market's close. So there, there, there's a definite benefit uh, of uh, leveraging the new technology. Obviously, it's not an easy road. So, uh, but again, I will say we're still in between. We still have tons of data that sits in the SQL Server. We're still leveraging SQL 2016 for a lot of new features. But at the same time, I think the challenge is to how to bridge those, the hybrid model where 80% of my data is still in traditional database, and where well, you know 20% of the compute power is in the, in, the, in the cloud, or alternative data is in the cloud. So that's still something that we, we we're trying to, to solve for. So I want to switch gears and talk about AI and machine learning. So I'll start with, with Eric. So in what ways is M ML being used at Acorns today? Um, so we have a data a team, we have three data teams, which is data engineering and data science team, data analytics team. So um, we provide the data to data science team. They, they, they do their self-service and do a lot of um, algorithm and things like that happening there. The, uh, for Acorns, it's kind of right now, the ML side is a little bit immature at this point, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of use cases coming in, such as fraud is coming in as, as one of the things that we're trying to uh, make it really robust. 
And second case, we just talked about like last week with our engineering team about this. Uh, when the users uh, try to get address verification, we can try to learn the machine learning for image detect detection that they upload their, their driver license and things like that. So they can actually automatically verify users um, using the algorithm like that. So those are two currently main use cases for ML side of it. Yeah. John Capital One. Yeah, we're using ML um, pretty broadly across the company. Uh, you know, I think ML is really, uh, in some ways, part of our DNA. Um, Capital One was started about 25 years ago in the early 90s, um, really based on the idea that we could uh, disrupt the financial industry by customizing um, credit cards and customizing financial products for people based on their their individual behavior and their data. And so it's kind of based on the you know original information revolution of, of the early 90s. And so when you apply for a credit card, it, you know, at least since Capital One has been here, it's never been the case that there's a human underwriting, underwriter you know, sitting um, on the other side who is looking at you and, and evaluating you. Instead, there's been a predictive algorithm and, mm -hmm. and sets of credit policy and rules that help make that decision. So that has, in the underwriting space, continually got more advanced. Um, and now we have the ability to embed predictive modeling and ML across fraud. Um, uh, digital marketing, customer experience, personalization. Uh, as you showed from JP Morgan earlier, you know, most of our customers are primarily digital now and that gives us a uh, wealth of data about them, but it also gives us uh, the opportunity to use that data to customize the experience and be proactive about the way that we interact with them. Um, streamlining and automating operations, um, even things like you know, automatically uh, scanning using optical recognition on, on paperwork to turn those things into digital processes to save a lot of money for the company and pass those savings on to our customers. Uh, so uh, I think it, it, it will be a better question in the future to ask, like, where are we not applying machine learning? Interesting. That's great. That's amazing. Ajay, M Science? Um, sure. Um, slightly different from the ACARNS Capital One example. Uh, we're more market focused, more mm -hmm. time series. Yep. Um, uh, well, in our space, when we, you kind of talk about ML AI, people expect this magical out of the box answer <laughs> that, hey, aren't you doing AI? Let's, let's, here you go, you should get the answer easily. It, it's, it's not that simple, especially because, I mean, alternative data, bringing back to alternative data, is, is a rather new phenomenon, yes. right? It's, data doesn't exist for that long. Right, because of the explosion of tech and mobile devices, as Michael referred to, that's that's pretty recent. So for us, a lot of the data that we gather, for us to use it in terms of forecasting and time series modeling is hard. Because, mm -hmm. in all honesty, we haven't seen enough data. Right. So, when, I mean, deep learning is like very very far away. Uh, but what we do use machine learning in our systems is to automate otherwise mundane human processes. So when I say automate otherwise mundane human processes, some of the stuff, a lot of the data that we get is unstructured, right? So it's text, context in some way, shape, or form. Uh, you could have a team sitting somewhere offshore that's sitting and writing regular expressions and processing through this information one by one and filtering and sorting. So what we do in that case is now we replace those with machines, right? So we, we run a bunch of clustering algorithms, k-means, and try to bring similar strings together where we can identify key markers in those texts where we can convert unstructured data into structured data. So to give you an example, um, if you've ever looked at your credit card statement, I mean, Starbucks is represented in 72 different ways, right? Because at the end of the day, it's about how the guy programs his POS system. So the manager could write star space box or put a star in the box or whatever it is. So you could have someone sit there and write a regular expression like, give me all the Starbucks and then keep filtering through, which can take months and months and months. Or you can now use a machine to get you 80% of the way there, right? You, you understand similarities. You could use distance measures, Levenstein traditions, X, Y, Z, fuzzy matching, where you can get 80% of the way there and say, hey, this is the entire pool. So now you've reduced the work, which would take you four months to go through billions of transactions with Starbucks in it down to maybe a couple of weeks of getting Starbucks done. So that's how we use machine learning. We also, I mean, for us, in our space, um, we think neural networks is kind of the future because we're trying to build relationships across data sets. So any data sets where we can, be, we can build some kind of cohort across them, because now when you start 
when you change the direction from uh, longitudinal to cross-sectional, you now have a lot of data points, right? Because you're looking across multiple users, multiple cohorts of users that can go into the millions. So now in that space, machine learning starts becoming really relevant, starts becoming really valuable. In the longitudinal space, again, 10 years from now, yes, huge. Um, I think in the quant space, they're finding more value there because, I mean, the equity markets have been around forever. Uh, you have price volume data, which is there, so you can statistically uh, measure um, different regimes, different regime changes, so that you can make sure that your model is accommodating for it. But for us, we're still a little further out in the alternative data space to use that solely as an individual measure. But in terms of using natural language processing uh, for converting, someone mentioned Twitter earlier, so we work with Twitter, where we're now extracting product information from, from Twitter. So when, as people are now tweeting about the fact that, hey, Kylie Jenner has launched a new lipstick. I mean, I love this subject. And, 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 it, and it's, it, it's ridiculously funny because, I mean, a lot of the clients that we speak to are like 55-year-old men who are now talking about Kylie Jenner and the Kardashians. Uh, which, it's fascinating that the world has changed this much. Um, and so what we do is now we're now tracking Twitter to understand that how are people and consumers talking about Kylie Jenner's new product and now finding translations and relationships between, okay, they talk about Kylie Jenner and they're excited about it. How does it now translate to them actually purchasing one of her cosmetics and now how does it translate into the revenue growth of maybe an Ulta Beauty or whatever that is, right? So that's where a lot of the, the applications that we find in machine learning actually come to play. I read that Kylie Jenner is the youngest self-made self billionaire. Uh, I think she's now at, at 900 million. Oh, yeah. I think she just dipped back down. So, what a shame. But it's um, <laughs> fascinating that she just beat Mark Zuckerberg. Though. Um, so as we wrap up, you know, I want the audience to get something out of it as well. So, um, so what are some of the, the lessons learned from your Databricks journey um, that you'd like to share with us? This open-ended. Uh, I'll jump in. Um, yep. So I, I think one thing we did well uh, in leveraging Databricks early on was we, uh, we I think, Try to, in, we, you know, I try to really take the mentality that um, my fellow associates, the analysts, the data scientists, the data engineers that we support, they are the customer um, of my work and of my team. And so uh, it was important when we started introducing Databricks to the company that we took a very organic approach. Um, we treated it like we would any other product in doing a POC, uh, pulling in teams um, from both an analyst, data scientist, and engineering perspective to test different use case patterns and figure out what works well and what doesn't, what do our users, what do our associates actually need, um, and then really roll it out organically and let it scale um, organically within the company, which meant that our associates were figuring out what worked and what didn't rather than us forcing it upon them. Um, and that organic uh, approach led to really large-scale success where I think we have roughly 1,500 associates using Databricks now across the enterprise. Um, I tend to find that instead if you take a very technology-focused approach, hey, this is the newest, latest, and greatest technology. Everybody's telling us it's what works, mm -hmm. so just use it. Stop using your old thing mm -hmm. and move over to this immediately. Um, it tends to frustrate people in a way that uh, makes the learning curve actually harder because instead of leaning into it, they're approaching it with skepticism from the very beginning. Um, and oftentimes, you're overconfident in what you think will work. You know, we started using Databricks, I don't know, three plus years ago at this point, and, and frankly, the product didn't do everything we needed it to do up front, and we shouldn't have expected it to. So that actually, I think, led to a better interaction with Databricks um, because we were clear on what was working and what wasn't. You were able to invest in the product and improve it um, to where it was what our associates needed it to be. Um, I think our another lesson, I think we're actually just learning our way through right now is um, to really invest massively, well, really invest deliberately in an approach towards metadata and how you manage metadata um, and how you manage uh, your data models and schemas um, and to build a system that allows for flexibility and, and continuous change, but yet uh, still results in <laughs> the result of that actually making sense to our associates. So I mentioned earlier, we have something like 20 times more data now available on the cloud than we did previously. So we've had this explosion of new forms of data. We've also rebuilt a lot of our um, operational customer-facing systems that then output the data that our associates use. 
And so we have a lot of kind of older traditional sources of data that are now being produced in ways that look different than they did before. And I think frankly, like we, we didn't get our approach towards metadata and data search and kind of data context right up front. And so we have all of this new data, but to your point from earlier, we're, not, we're only probably using a fraction of it. And in order to understand how to use the data effectively, a lot of times you have to go to the, the people that created it or you have to go to the, the experts who have used it successfully before. So we have a lot of tribal knowledge and haven't really unlocked and, and spread that subject matter expertise in a really scalable, systematic way across the company. So that's actually where we're focusing right now pretty heavily um, within the company. Anyone else? So I guess uh, for, for us, uh, we, we have a little bit interesting challenge, I guess. Uh, we, uh, we, we started the cloud journey, uh, I would say, two, three years ago. Right? So obviously, with Michael's joined the firm, uh, we start introducing AWS into the firm. But at the same time, uh, New Burger also has Microsoft Azure. So we actually have two competing cloud technology within the firm. Not to mention, we also have on-prem, you know, the traditional infrastructure set up. So I will first, I will say first challenge that we have is, is, is get this idea pushed through uh, ISO, the Information Security Officer, right? So let them understand th there are things that we want to do in the cloud without jeopardizing the, the, the risk or the, you know, the reputation risk or you know, information loss. So there's a lot of things that we have to, we have to uh, work partner with our ISO officers and, and to, to, to make things happen. But at the same time, um, the tools that we got from, I would say, from Databricks was great for data science, uh, for data scientists, but not so great for, for the quant. And I think that's remain one of the challenges that we have because we have a close environment, right? So if you look at the, the typical quant who use, um, you know, in this case, MATLAB, it, it's a very close environment, right? So to have this close environment software talks to open source in, uh, system in the cloud is not an easy journey. And we're still having the problem, uh, as, and in fact, I think we, we still we have a, a, a pilot project that working with MathWorks and, and, and Databricks and trying to build a, a better bridge. So when I get a data frame from Databricks, I can actually use that data frame in my MATLAB code as a real object. And that still remains a challenge. We still have to use JDBC to shuffle data back and forth. It's not pleasant. So I would say in the tool why, I think that's still one thing that we try to solve for. Uh, the second thing we also try to solve software is just the uh, the market data, right? So uh, obviously a lot of people, a lot of you in the in the banking industry use a lot of the market data. Uh, the pipeline that we have in, uh, for the market data is still not there. That which means we still have to move the data in from FTP server, from, you know, from 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 B pipe or from from you know, you know server API down to the internal storage, and then selectively push data back to the cloud, so you know certain model can be can be run over there. So. I would say the whole process is still not very fluent. And, and I think today, you know, I'm very pleasant to see Microsoft actually now has the .NET driver <laughs> for, for Databricks. <laughs> so yes, Microsoft. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> so that, at least that's <laughs> that solved half the problem. Uh, but I would say, you know, in order to, to see more investment banking to embrace the, the technology, I, I would say the tool has to get better. I mean, until then, we still have a traditional quant that's not willing to move forward, right? Doesn't matter how fast the process can run, if my, if my data is not there, if my software, can, if I cannot do anything from my desktop, I'm not going there. I mean, you're still gonna have the pushback from the, uh, uh, from the traditional quant. Uh, so I think that, that remained the challenge to us. Um, so for acorns, I think the, um, so when we actually look into data science world and it was kind of slam dunk kind of answer for us to to use Databricks. So there was no uh, way other than using Databricks at, when we actually started the journey. Mm. Um, even that's the that's the case as we develop as we go along this alongside with you guys together. It was really surprising that they they it seemed like they knew what we are face challenge with. So for example, Delta came last year, as soon as they came, we were kind of challenged with how we can do uh, change data capture, and that, that solved the problem. And now we are looking into um, actually having consolidated data lake. Now they solved the problem for us. Um, so it's really interesting to see, to walk the journey together. That was, that's been really interesting 
because I, I felt like um, every challenge that, that we had, that we had a solution to provide us. Yeah. So that was, prob that was interesting. And the lesson, one, the lesson that we learned through the last two or three years is that um, make your data lake foundation strong, mm -hmm. meaning with, with the streaming data. So that's, that's, the, um, that's the lesson that as, as much as you can do streaming, you should start doing that right now or no more moving stuff physically around between the environment to environment. That's really not the answer going forward. So even the lambda structures, lambda is not going to be um, answering our questions. It's going to be all streaming and event sourcing kind of architecture we, we need to build up on. So that's the lesson that we learned. Cool. So um, I know people are getting a little thirsty. So uh, I'll open it up to Q&A if anyone has questions. Right there. I wouldn't be able to tell by your shirt, by the way. <laughs> no. So you were talking about tribal knowledge, and that's actually kind of why I came to this conference, because I wanted to get more information. So I came to this conference because I wanted to get more information on Databricks and how we could use it, because I work, I support the global finance team at Capital One, as opposed to credit cards like you do. So with, with working at a financial institution at, like Capital One, a like bank, there's a lot of data governance that has to go along with it. And my question to you was basically the question that I was trying to answer coming to this conference was how do you, you know, develop these models? How do you get all this data and productionalize it in such a way that it's compliant with what Capital One is enforcing? Which models? And so <laughs> I, think, I think part of the answer is that we face different regulatory and compliance requirements in different parts of our business. Mm -hmm. um, so I know uh, the credit card business uh, specifically well and in particular um, have worked a lot in underwriting um, both at kind of the point of opening a new credit card as well as underwriting decisions we make kind of throughout the life cycle of a, a, a person. And so we face a really high bar particularly around auditability and explainability of our decisions. Um, and so uh, I think this is worth sharing broadly. Like uh, for every underwriting decision we ever make, we need the ability if our regulator comes in to explain for each individual person, each individual decision, why that was made. We need to be able to show the audit trail back the, the data that was used for the decision. And we need to be able to explain exactly why did the model make the prediction that they did. And at underwriting stage, we also need to provide a uh, rationale to the person if they were declined. Um, so the way in which we do that and the way in which we create that explainability and governance, I can't explain uh, on stage here. It's, <laughs> I think, part of the, the secret sauce of what makes Capital One good. But we can pull up offline and we can talk more about it. I love that. Thank you. Anyone else? Right there. So... Um, so we also recently adopted Databricks um, at Nationwide Insurance. So our main challenge is like a lot of people doing uh, modeling with R or Python on their local desktop. If you ask them to move over, they say, hey, why do I have to pay for something which I'm able to do it free, right? Uh, plus, there are other uh, AWS native services, including for data engineering and, and also for data science. Uh, SageMaker and also like EMR and, and things like that. How do you face uh, or answer those challenges? How do you tackle those and how do you make people to actually move into uh, platforms like Databricks? Well, I'll admit that um, you know we use Databricks and we use Spark heavily, but it's not the only tool that we use. We have a number of tools in our toolbox. Uh, and so I think uh, that's Part, first of all, I think of the way that we view our culture is that we need to, in, we, are, we hire great, smart people, and at times we need to get out of their way and let them be successful and not always tell them, like, this is the one tool and the one way to do things. Um, that does sometimes lead to a sprawl of complexity, and so you need to balance between how much kind of local innovation can you enable, and yet if you take that to the extreme, the cost of supporting a myriad of different experiences and perhaps siloed solutions uh, may become unsustainable for your business. Um, and, and so 
that's part of, I think, the role that uh, architecture plays within our company. It's part of the role that pro our product managers play is to, um, and my team, for example, plays is to be, actually work horizontally across different business domains, try to understand the needs of each, and kind of pull out of that the common capabilities um, that we should be exposing. And so sometimes it's, it's actually about let teams innovate locally, let them figure out what works well, and then let's start to pick some winners out of that. And then when it becomes clear what the winners are, like push everybody to adopt that for the sake of uh, kind of efficiency of scale. I want to add to something to that. Uh, so um, so we, ha we have a similar problem, obviously. Um, a lot of our analysts still work on the desktop, and they, they, if you ask them, they, they either like a particular package they, they, they use in the software, or they just don't, doesn't want to learn a new language, right? So that, that happens all the time. So um, obviously with uh, Spark 2, now you have Spark SQL, and, and with, um, in most cases with a you know, JDBC driver, the, the analyst should be able to write the regular SQL. The, traditionally, you write SQL against database. Now you just have this JDBC driver points to Databricks cluster. Makes no difference. So usually the first try, the first thing we do is to prove to them that the transitioning from, um, from the old way to the new way is not that hard. You can still do a lot of things from your desktop, right? It's not the best way to do it. But once they get, get the idea that the data can still be retrieved in the same way, then we start introducing to them you know, doing the, the, the workbook, notebook on, on the server, and then you do use a DB Connect you know, to call out to those workbook to do certain work and treat those as a, as a subroutine or a sub package. So it, it's a gradual, pro, a gradual process, right? So you start with you know, the, the standard Spark SQL, and I'm sure a lot of people will, will get, get the idea right away. And the ability to call out to those, you know, to call those, uh, to treat data, databricks as just as a, another database is actually a very easy uh, selling point. So that's, uh, that's how we, we start with our conversation and gradually convert their process over. Um, so something to think about. Good, sorry, go ahead. After you. For, for EMR versus uh, um, databricks, that question comes a lot to us. and. Actually, that's, that's some of some topics in engineering. So, we 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 select uh, we select the tools that it's going to best work for the team perspective. So, our data engineering was quickly adopting the Databricks faster than EMR. So that's how we went. So it's basically challenge versus the, um, the champion kind of model that we use from the uh, how they use Databricks. Um, you know, a lot of data science team has been using Python, right? Um, there was a lot of hand-holding from our data engineering team to use Scala. So that took some time to kind of get over, but it was, it was kind of hard work, but it had, they had to be kind of one-on-one kind of, one -on -one kind of coaching kind of sessions going on so that they can adopt the Scala better than Python. So that was one example I can give you. Sorry, I didn't want to drag this on so long, but... I kind of came from the other perspective, right? So we snapped to Databricks, everybody. Nobody had a choice, right? So we literally did the other way. Um, and I, I'll give you my perspective because it came from there. And, but again, uh, going back to your point, if you don't need scale and you don't need compute, don't move to the cloud. It, it's not like because everyone's doing it, let's do it. it. It's very, very clear. I know we're in a Databricks conference and <laughs> it's, it's Microsoft Azure and, and AWS, but if there is something that I've learned from all of this, there are certain things that you don't need cloud computing for, right? It solves the problem too, but if there is an entire phase shift that you need to go through and there's a battle you need to fight within your firm, it's very, very important that you know exact what value you're gonna bring by that move. And a lot of people don't do that, right? A lot of people think that, hey, this is a really cool thing. We could use it sometime in the future, so we should use it. But as, as, as somebody who's, who's head of data science and engineering and is also responsible for the leadership and the revenue of the company and cost efficiency and all of those things, that's something that everybody needs to look at, which is what is the cost benefit of actually making this move and evaluating it? That said, the person who's the most effective in doing that is, is the technology organization, right? And the way that you do that in the technology organization the firm is that you profile usage. So getting a person who's, who's always written, written R or Python, I was one of those guys, 
because I used to work at Citadel and write systematic strategies, I get comfortable in my space, and as long as things are within the boundaries of what I think it's okay for it to work in, I'm okay with it. I'm like, it's working fine, the ship is not sinking, why fix it? But at some point, it starts, it, people get used to the normal. So if it takes a week, people are used to, yeah, it takes a week. This is about, okay, I'm gonna run a process now, I'm gonna wait for a week, and then it's gonna complete. Uh, but now it starts becoming the responsibility of the technology organization to show that, hey, you know what, you don't really need to wait for a week. You can get this done in an hour. Do you think you need it in an hour? And that has to be a separate conversation. A lot of people actually, I mean, the reason why we and I snapped to Databricks is because we profile the usage and we're a big data company. Everything we do is MapReduce. Like a first step of every data set we bring in is how do we map this string to something that we care about, and then how do we aggregate? So that created a natural propensity for us to create scale. But also keep in mind, change is hard. Nobody liked me in, in August of 2017. Like the, everybody within the firm was like, dude, this guy's making our life miserable. Mm. And I was like the bad guy for about four months, right? The fifth month came about, and everyone was like, and we're in a position where we now have about 70% of the efficiency of, of our team members. We have revenue growth, which is about 40% year on year. Um, we have created about twice the number of products that we would have otherwise. And now at that point, everyone's like, we couldn't have done it without the cloud and Databricks. So there is a balance between taking, I mean, my perspective again, right? Respecting everybody else's perspective is taking feedback from somebody who, for lack of a better word, does not know better, and providing that cost benefit of this is what you can do and this is how you can do it, and how is it going to help the structure as a whole? Great. Um, people sound like they're having a lot of fun outside. Yeah. Um, so maybe last question, if there is a last question. Keep going. So. Um, I run a financial services and trading product for my company, and I'm sold when you guys talk about ingest management, you know, cleaning, parsing, semantifying data sets uh, for the purposes of signal amplification and hopefully alpha generation. What are your thoughts towards applying the same concepts for the other side of the use case, which is after that happens, trade surveillance, market abuse detection, because there's a lot of data there, and I know that it's a huge operational concern as well in terms of the use cases. So it's open ended question. What was the last part again? I'm sorry. Market abuse, market abuse de de detection, trade trade surveillance, you know. This is not my domain. I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, it's so I could speak about it briefly. It's it's because I have a couple of friends who work in Goldman Sachs and they do this. I'm not the authority again, so uh, don't take my writing as, as, as the word. Uh, my speaking is the word, sorry. Um, so the, it is definitely being used, right? So uh, these firms at large scale are now, it's like fraud detection in a certain way, but what they're doing is they're now uh, trying to analyze using large amounts of data. So these large firms are now, I mean, as a financial company, you have to save seven years of every communication you have, right, in any tool that you use, whether it's Bloomberg, your emails, your internal chat tool, whatever it is. So what these guys are doing is that they're now trying to find relationships across what your communication patterns are and what you're saying to any trading activity, right? So say you're a broker-dealer and, um, and you, under, you have access to some information or someone tells you something and then you go make this big trade for one of your clients and you get a high commission on it. So now they're trying to find relationships between has this person had access or contact or, or an email or any type of communication with somebody else which is sharing certain kinds of information and, and did he put on a trade immediately after, right? So in, in actuality, um, I think a large part of the ML and AI aspects of it applies in that space more than it does in alpha right now, my view, again, is because there's a vast amount of data, right? Because when you're thinking about these things, you're starting to think cross-sectionally again. You're not doing some time series predictions, right?
right? You're trying to analyze human behavior with result. And you're trying to establish causality, right? In a certain way and not correlations. So what that gives you is a large amount of information. It's, it's kind of very similar to how you'd, you'd predict credit card fraud, right? Which is, is this person and his behavior historically, you're trying to create a behavioral trait to say that this person has this trait, he performs in a certain way in these situations, and hence he is not a person you should give a $25,000 loan to. If he is, does not satisfy the criteria, you can give him. So it's, it's very, very similar in that space. A lot of people also, so, I mean, we're owned by a parent company, which is Jeffrey's Financial Group, and one of our sister companies is Jeffrey's the bank. So they use this extensively. So they actually have a project internally where they're, where they're assessing uh, internal risks, because they have a broker-dealer network. They're assessing internal risks using Databricks. They're also a Databricks client. Um, and they're assessing internal risks exactly with that. And also in terms of portfolio risks. Now, uh, very, very interesting. So portfolio breakdowns into, into risk factors. I mean, there are traditional borrow models that are out there, and then people add, add factors to it. So it's always been a now cast, right? Or it's been a prior situation. What is the position of our portfolio right now, and what are the exposures that we have? So now what people are trying to do is to use that information to now forecast future risk events and to reposition their portfolio appropriately outside of alpha generation to protect themselves from the risk events. So those things are definitely happening. And I mean, if they're not, they should. I would say two things. One, you know, FINRA is a big customer of Databricks. They, they analyze 150 billion stock market events a day in order to assess anomalies and trading behavior. The second thing is, you know, kind of to, to your point earlier about like sometimes it's not a big data problem. Um, you know, I, I, I can tell you a story of, of a hedge fund where a particular portfolio manager would make very bad trades every third Monday. Okay, so every third Monday he would hit his risk limits and make, make bad trades. So they went back and they did all these analysis on like what is he doing, what's happening in the stock market, and, and all of a sudden they spent all this time and data science energy looking into it. It turns out he has MMA class Sunday at 4 p.m. So every morning on Monday, he comes in all jazzed, and he makes you know, poor decisions. So it had nothing to do with data, you know, everything to do with sort of the, the human elements of it. We're all um, trying to figure out who that was by now. Yeah, exactly. We're all thinking about names. <laughs> yeah, I, I could see his face like turning through all the, all the hedge fund managers he knows. Um, maybe we have one more. I think we had one more question in the back. This one is for John. Uh, so uh, Apple made this announcement few days back about their new credit card. It's a very big move from Apple. So uh, traditional credit card companies Goldman like Sachs. Capital One and uh, there are other big banks. Yeah. What do you think will be the effect of this on your business? And what steps do you see yourself taking in the next few days or few months to like uh, counteract this act from Apple? Uh, so if you couldn't hear the question. Uh, Apple announced a branded or co-branded credit card along with uh, Marcus, uh, which is uh, the consumer lending arm of Goldman Sachs. Um, so I think it's a, an interesting product, particularly from the lens that um, Apple is essentially going to be like selling it within their products as part of the Apple Pay um, product. And so it's a you know, I, I wouldn't really call it that unique in that if you go to Amazon and you shop on Amazon, they're gonna sell you their co-branded card, um, which is issued by Chase as part of the checkout process. And so I think this type of co-branded partnership is pretty common and tends to have fairly high uh, rewards um, as a result. Um, so I think we'll have to see how consumers respond to that and particularly how Apple kind of markets that and what kind of uptake they have um, as doing that in this kind of synergistic way through Apple Pay. But uh, just to be honest, when I look at the product and how it operates, it operates as a normal credit card. Um, it has fairly standard rewards. Um, and so I think we see it as yet another competitor, but not something that is really, uh, at least at this point in time, really shaking up the entire industry. So that's my, my personal view at this point in time based on what I know. Awesome. Well, with that, thank you so much, John, uh, Ming, Eric, and Ajay. Um, and thank you so much. Um, thank you. So we're going to break for, or we're, we're concluding. But before that, I just want to get Nick up here for one second um, t from our marketing team. Um, maybe can you take one of that mic? That, that mic? Like that, yeah. I don't have the slides. Yeah, yeah. Um, can, can 
Turn this mic on. Sorry, it's on now. Um, ooh. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I think right now your guys are going to head outside and have a drink. Um, I work in the Databricks uh, marketing team. I actually run, as you may tell by my accent, I actually run marketing in EMEA. Um, but I'm kind of working on a global uh, Databricks branding project right now. And you guys in the room uh, are amongst our most trusted customers or people that are, are most close to the type of work that uh, we do today. And we'd love to get some of your feedback on our brand, what it means to you, what our people mean to you, and the kind of words that you would use to describe us, our product, and, and our services. Because as we seek to kind of rebrand and amplify our message, we want to make sure we're using the language that resonates with you guys. Uh, the advantage that everyone in this room has is that you're all from like the fintech vertical. So um, it's really good for us to get a perspective from different types of organizations. So you, you're all in a, a highly regulated world. So the kinds of words that you use might be completely different to the, um, uh, I don't know, some of the retailers that are a little bit more fun uh, and funky with the way that they kind of want to perceive themselves. So um, with that in mind, when you leave eventually here after having a few drinks and uh, you're quite happy, uh, when you go down in the elevator, and, uh, and then you turn left to head towards the door. As you turn left, uh, if you look straight across, there'll be a bar. There's a, another Databricks uh, kind of bar sign. And myself and another English guy will be just in there. Uh, it literally takes about eight to 10 minutes tops. So if you can spare us those eight to 10 minutes, I would be really, really very grateful. Uh, and if you don't, then probably at some point this evening, I'm gonna email all of you and ask you, please, will you talk to me tomorrow? So it's much less pain if you've had a few drinks and you call in and see me afterwards. So uh, with that, uh, I hope to see many of you just outside the elevator straight across in the bar afterwards and I'll hand you back over. Thank you. <laughs> um, and, and don't forget to rate the session after you have a few drinks.